Welcome to the GTN show. Welcome. On today's show, we discuss Ironman's new qualification rules for the Ironman World Champs in Nice 2024. Yeah, and we see technology being adopted into our sport with form goggles now being allowed in triathlon events. And we're also going to see race ranger technology on the pros bikes at Challenge Roth. Let's start the show. Well, we're going to kick things off as usual with stuff that we have spotted online and this first one comes from Running Peak and Run Globe and it was just over a week ago when I saw this post that it had a mile race on track that was floodlit, it was in the evening, the Magnum Mile and suddenly the lights went out quite literally <laughs> um, and this is not a metaphor for anyone racing and um, it was quite cool because everyone obviously was standing there watching with their iPhones as you do so they got their torches out um, and it looks quite spectacular actually. Yeah, so, pretty cool. Next time they'll just uh, do the dark mile or something. Yeah, exactly. Everyone I reckon there could be charge. something in that, couldn't yeah, there? Yeah, <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, next one we have this from Ellie Greenwood uh, and this is a bit of a controversy brewing in the uh, ultra trail running community. Um, Ironman have bought Ultra Trail Whistler or created Ultra Trail Whistler uh, at the expense of an established race. And she says they trail and ultra runners, our sport is at a crossroads and it's time to decide what you want our sport and community to be like. You may have seen the announcement that UTMB, who are partially owned by Ironman, will be hosting a trail race in Whistler next September. Sounds like Whisper Alpine Meadows, which is a small local company uh, where they've founded and worked their tails off to start this race and the race didn't get the permits. And then when there was no race there, Iron Man or UTMB scrapped <laughs> in and said, uh, well, we'll put a race there then, hmm. which all seems a little bit suspicious. And it's uh, not just Ellie Greenwood. There's a few others who are, who are in the trail running community are speaking out about this. It seems to be a bit of a controversy, Brune. We'll keep our eyes on it. Um, we don't Iron Man bash, yeah. you know, anything. I like yeah. the Freudian slip as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, a little bit maybe. <laughs> um, I mean, it is obviously Iron Man's a business, UTMB is a business, mm. um, and UTMB is now owned by Iron Man. So they are changing their model a little bit. You now have to race for stones to get into UTMB, which is like qualification mm. slots for an Iron Man. And obviously to have these qualifications, they need qualification races, which means they have to start the series all over the world, which is what they're doing but that may be at the expense of local yeah. organisers and uh, the trail yeah. running community may be not so happy about that at the moment. Yeah. I'm sure there's always two sides to the story, but um, it is a shame when local races fold for whatever reason, but um, hopefully there's still plenty of races out there for, for ultra running. Well, talking of trail running, we've just seen Heather Jackson, who was formerly a triathlete and a very successful triathlete who's transitioned incredibly well to the gravel racing and ultra trail racing, and she has just won at the Havelina 100, which um, apparently is the second fastest time ever recorded recorded on this course and yeah just very impressive she's definitely very getting um, the likes of Courtney Dormwater congratulating her and people are really noticing her in the ultra world aren't they so yeah. um, I think that's an awesome result very for impressive her. speaking of Courtney Dormwater uh, she said she always wanted to do a race with her mum so she did this one the Havelina 100 with her mum and did the whole 100k's which is I mean clearly it's in the genes that is very impressive yeah. <laughs> I think they tried a 50 miler and they, they'd missed the cutoff time a while ago so we thought well why not go for the 100k uh, next yeah, time because <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> yeah uh, that's very cool uh, back to triathlon uh, spotted this post from Leon Chevalier who obviously was, had a great race in Nice and had a bit of time off and including running our local half marathon in a time of one hour six minutes <laughs> ridiculously fast well, and time off yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I think last year in his time off, didn't Mark go and do a, a, do the um, FKT around Bath with yeah, him? Yeah, exactly. But, um, <laughs> the Dan Booth realm. Yeah, and um, so anyway, he has now just announced that he's going to race Ironman Cozumel in three weeks' time. So it'll be interesting to see how his sort of fitness and end-of-season um, vibes are going, running into that. Yeah, quite a few people doing some end-of-season, mm. trying to capitalise on their fitness. We'll get to the races coming up a little bit later. Uh, and then we saw this one, actually on YouTube, where a running store allowed their customers to steal the shoes. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. So basically, um, Distance Running Store teamed up with French sprinter Mebe Macal Zeze and um, put him in as the security guard. Now, the, the deal was, you know, there's certain shoes that you could steal that were, had the label, and if you could steal them and outrun 
this French sprinter who has competed at the Olympic Games, then you've got to keep your goods. Now, I think he had a busy day because yeah. apparently there were <laughs> um, 76 sprints, I think, and more chases or um, robberies, whatever you want to call them. He won 74, or he caught 74 shoplifters, but two lucky or two very fast runners managed to get away. So yeah. it's just quite a fun marketing Got campaign. Got some, some free shoes, and we're talking about it. So, yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool gimmick, I think. Yeah. yeah, very impressive. And then finally, we have this, because the weather has changed in Boulder, and uh, the pro triathletes are bringing you the weather in Boulder since forever. So we had a Holly Lawrence a post, uh, picture of the snow outside in Boulder and saying it's definitely an indoor day. And then uh, Marinda Coffre also saying that her dog is loving the snow and she's also loving it because she doesn't actually have to go outside and train in it anymore. Yeah, so, yeah. what a shock they're going from for, for Marinda going from Hawaii back to that. Yeah, must have been a bit <laughs> of a shock to the system. All right, moving on with our news and we're going to have a bit of a discussion about this because Ironman have announced that there are new qualification criteria for the 2024 Ironman World Champs that are going to be happening in, in Nice in 2024. The, this will be obviously a women's only event after the women were in Kona this year and the men were in Nice. Next year it flips around. The women will be in Nice. And currently, the way you qualify is with the slots and the slot roll down. So basically the top, there are a certain number of slots for each category, each age category, depending on how many competitors are in that category. So if there's lots of competitors, you might have five slots. If there's very few, you might only have one or two. Uh, and then it rolls down and it can roll all the way down to very low finishes or could not be taken at all. And it seems like there's been a bit of a slow uptake on these slots so far in the qualifying races for uh, Nice 2024. And because of fears of maybe Nice 2024 being a bit of a uh, empty event with 800 or even less competitors coming to the start line, given the current uptake, Ironman have moved the goalposts a little bit and given three new qualifying criteria or ways to qualify to the woman. Yeah, so those are the first one being if you finish top 10 in your age group at the World Championships in Kona that we've just had, then you will automatically get a slot. You still have to validate that slot, and it also notably doesn't roll down. So say a few people don't take that, doesn't mean 11th, 12th, etc. get the spaces. So those top 10, which will discuss more about what that means in a moment. Um, you've also then got, which is I think the most surprising one, this addition of allocated 70.3 events. So they have selected a number of 70.3 events, which they have said will have automatic qualification shots for the top five in each age group. Now that one at the moment, I can't see anything about saying you have to even validate. So that's um, an you interesting- You can do Ironman World Champs without ever having done yeah. an Ironman before. Those ones also though, don't roll down. So if the yep. top five don't take them, sixth, seventh, eighth don't get them. Yep. It's only for the top five in those categories. Uh, yeah, and then the final new addition is the all world athlete. So this is a system they have of ranking throughout the year of your best results. Those at the top of their age group at the end of the 2023 world ranking will be offered a slot and they will have to validate with a full Ironman in the following year. Um, and Andrew, Messick has said here that it gives us confidence we'll be able to have a very competitive field of 2,000 or more athletes in Nice and already we're seeing the fastest women taking their slots that's only part of it we want everyone who's qualified to feel like they've accomplished something meaningful and having slots roll super super deep is not a look that we like so um, yes there. yeah he goes on to say it doesn't have to be as hard as it used to be to get to Kona where for many women's age groupers, you pretty much had to win mm. to get there. But there should be some exclusivity about qualifying for the world champs. So the question is, why now? Why didn't they do this at the beginning of the qualification window or later on down the line? And I, the reason is because Nice, right? Because it's in Nice. And in Nice 2023, the men's race, nearly 50% of the field was American. And they're going to need the same kind of numbers of American women to take up the slots in Nice, and they just weren't seeing that in the American races that have happened so far. Uh, so they needed to do something and do something quickly because they don't want to find themselves in a position uh, in the middle of the summer next year where they're going, Nice is not going to be full. Let's go back through all those results lists and start sending emails to people saying, do you want your slot? Uh, because that's definitely not a good look. And also not having many athletes on the start line is also not a good look. So I may needed to do something pretty sharpish. Uh, and so they've come up with this thing. Um, I'm not sure it's actually going to work that well, to be honest, because it feels like most of those people who would get these slots 
would already be getting these slots. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. So Mertic goes on here, basically, like you're saying, to say about the fear. Nobody wants to see an 800-person race in Nice next year. It's terrible in every respect. We also know that women's participation patterns are different from men. So we're offering a different pathway to fill the Nice race that because of the unique nature of Kona, we're not going to be able to offer to men. And it's interesting because actually mm. the Kona has filled up really quickly for the men, partly um, by quite a lot of participants who had qualified but for the new qualification open, so to speak. So when it was announced of this split year, um, athletes were given the option of deferring, not racing in Nice, just gone, and actually deferring to next year. And 92% of those offered took that up, which just yeah. shows the appeal of Kona. Yeah, it seems that despite a lot of discussions, we've had a lot of discussions on this show whether splitting the world champs is a good idea. And it seems like most people, it's about 50-50. Some people think it's a good idea and some people think it should still be Kona. The athletes are kind of voting with their slots or with their race entries and going, no, we want it in Kona because there just is not the same uptake uh, for Nice. The, as Heather says, 50% of the Kona slots for the men for 2024 were gone before they had even had the Nice race. Yeah. Uh, and that is interesting because the similar thing has happened. Andrew Messick does, does go on to say that uh, the uptake of slots since Nice was successfully held has actually increased. Yeah. It's got better. More people are taking it since they saw that it was successful and was quite a special event by yeah, all yeah, accounts. Yeah, it's great. So people have taken up more slots because no one wanted to sign up for a race that had never happened and didn't know whether it was going to be successful. But even so, they're clearly pretty worried about uh, there being enough women there. I mean, I think it's also quite interesting of that 70.3 allocation. There's a lot of races from that that people could be going to their first full Ironman at Nice, yeah, which is a tough course. Yeah, there's 21 70.3s on that list That's... of five from each category at 21 Do different sections. There's a lot of people that are going to be there that could potentially have never done an Ironman before, which seems absolutely mad. And, and interesting, speaking to some of the female pros out in, in Kona, quite a lot of them who are pros were actually apprehensive about the course in Nice. And you know, mostly the North American athletes because they just have straighter roads that are less technical and things. So I imagine yeah. for age groupers, that's going to be exacerbated as well for American yeah. And, age yeah, which is exactly who they're targeting yeah. getting there. So it is interesting. Uh, obviously, it begs the question. They've already announced that for four years, this will be the mm. pattern of, of men and women alternating in Nice and Kona. Um, and that question was put to Andrew Messick, and he said, well, yes, that is the plan. However, it is based on success. And if it's not successful, they may look at changing it. So the question is, do you think it's going to be successful for the woman in 2024 in Nice? And will they keep this up for another four years? Or do you think we're going to see the whole shebang changed again and the whole thrown out again and changed, you know, all back to Kona or all to a different race? Or, or well, I mean, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But it does uh, get the discussion going, doesn't it? Mm. And now on with tech news. And we have some news that's come out well, with relation to form swim goggles. Now, these are goggles that have displays on the screen whilst you're swimming, which are great for training. And until now, they've not been allowed in any race settings. But that has just changed. It's gone through a review at the World Triathlon Technical Committee. And as a result, they have said that at all World Triathlon sanctioned events, it's going to be allowed to be used by pros and age groupers. So that's going to include the PTO races, Super League races, World Triathlon triathlon, USA triathlon, and like I said, anything that is sanctioned by the World Triathlon. Yeah, so now you can use the head-up display or the in-goggle display, the augmented reality, to see your time and your stroke rate while you're swimming in the open water. And of course, when you pair it with a smartwatch from Garmin or Apple, you can also see your speed, your distance, and your heart rate, all in a head-up display, so you don't have to look at your watch while you're swimming. Uh, being able to wear form goggles in competition races will help professional and amateur triathletes in a number of ways, explains uh, Brian Johns, the head of coaching science at Form. For a start, it'll enable athletes to pace themselves and manage their effort, particularly at the start of a race in the water. Athletes can quickly assess how far they swim and still have to go. It'll also help with real-time stroke rate and allow them to execute their race plan more precisely. The approval catches up swimming to both running and cycling for the use of technology in competition. The other benefit is, of course, that athletes experience less anxiety in the water because they feel less alone. I'm not sure about that last point. <laughs> uh, we a bit of a robot with you maybe holding your hand. It's, but not, it's <laughs> not chatting to you, coaching you through it, unless maybe yeah. that's something that's going to come. Of like, I guess you know, keep it up, you can do it, you're almost there. I guess it does help in that you don't feel like you're going nowhere. You actually have some <laughs> feedback that you are actually moving. I don't, know, I don't know if I'd that, want it. That is a real thing you get in the ocean where yeah. you feel like you've been swimming for ages yeah. and you've got nowhere. So. Or I feel like I'm swimming really fast and it's going to tell me that I'm not. 
<laughs> I mean, no, yeah, I'm maybe <laughs> maybe not the kind of feedback you want. I, I'll be honest. I was writing a script the other day on data, and I was like. I don't know whether you're actually allowed to use mm. form goggles in a race. Well, it turns out you weren't allowed to when I wrote that script, but now you are. Yeah, so. I, I do think it's going to be, I think it might seem more people actually taking up form goggles for the racing yeah. aspect. I mean, mainly for age groupers. I feel like pros, you've just got to go with the race, race dynamic and you're not having yeah. chance to think about, oh, no, I don't want to go a little bit quicker than that. All my heart rate's going a bit high. I mean, Yeah, it's not really an option. You just have to go with the feet you can get on. Yeah. yeah. True. But will we'll be interesting. Well, we have another piece of tech news announcement coming from Race Ranger, the device which actually measures how, well, to prevent drafting. And they have teamed up with Challenge Roth, and it's going to be on all of the pros bikes at that race next year. That's right. Uh, Challenge Roth have been trying to improve the officiating and the fairness of their race. And now they've incorporated Race Ranger. Race Ranger was developed in New Zealand and was tested a few times last year, including at uh, the World Triathlon event to World Champs in Ibiza. We actually saw it in action there. We made a whole video on it, so if you want to find out more about the devices, uh, you can watch that video after you've watched this video. Uh, it's uh, it worked pretty well. It was used at that World Triathlon event. It was also used at the Paralympic test event and it was also used at Challenge Wanaka last year in real world situations and fairly successfully. It basically consists of two devices. One goes on your front fork and one goes on under your seat post. And those devices detect the other devices that are in front or behind them and measure the distance pretty accurately down to like 10 centimeters uh, and then displays a color light so you can see whether you are orange, red or blue as in too close on the, on the limit or safe following distance and you can change that distance to 12 meters or 20 meters depending on what your race uh, rules are. So it was pretty successful last year and now obviously we're going to see it at the biggest long distance race in the world next year, which is a big step in the right direction for fairness and, uh, and anti-drafting, which is obviously something we all want to see. Yeah, I think it's something Challenge have always been very much at the forefront of, haven't they? Um, and the director, Felix, here says, our goal is always to make the race even fairer. Race Ranger is a technical revolution, supports our race judges in determining the drafting distances in a completely objective way. They can now see at a glance if an athlete is too close to the person in front. The system is also a great support for the athletes themselves to better assess their own following distances and I think I mean the athletes have just been so positive about this haven't they because it's when they do get paying none of them want to be drafting or they yeah. do, or if they see someone else you know then they know that hopefully it's going to be a much fairer race. It's important to point out that the, this device doesn't actually officiate yeah. it doesn't actually make any rulings it's just a colour light so the referees can see that colour and see whether how close a person is and so can the other athletes mm. so it's still uh, the athletes are really supported in that it's kind of it allows you to self-officiate. Yes. You can see how close you are, so you don't mm. go in, and you're gonna see what your fellow competitors are doing, and you can kind of give them a dirty look if they're <laughs> a bit too close. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's not quite at the point yet where you can it can just send, Stop you, send yeah. information <laughs> to the referee and automatically give you a red yeah. card, but uh, oh, you know, maybe in the future. On to race news and it's quite short this week mm -hmm. as we're getting towards the end of the season. But there was a World Cup in Miziaki and it's kind of quite important at the moment because of Olympic qualification. We are very much in the Olympic season or the Olympic year. And in the women's race, we've seen Gwen Jorgensen win her last two World Cups in this bid to get as many world ranking points and move up through the rankings as possible. Now, she was still on great form but didn't manage to top the podium. It was Bianchi Seregini, um, Seregni sorry, who won that race ahead of Gwen Jorgensen and Gianni Lee Hare was third for Luxembourg. Now, interestingly though, even with that with that second, it has put Gwen Jorgensen, moved her up 10 places in the world ranking and overtaking two of the Americans. But the adept in America is so strong that she's still the sixth USA woman at the moment. Yeah, still got her work cut out for her. Meanwhile, on the men's side, we had a bit of a breakthrough performance from a British athlete. Uh, Hugo Milner, uh, 25 year old, ran his way from a minute down all the way up to the win with an impressive 29-33 10K run, which is uh, well, flying. Mad. Yeah, uh, Alex Yee kind of levels. Um, he was ahead of Dylan McCulloch in second and Lasse Priester from Germany in third. Um, again, we talk about Olympic aspirations. Uh, Hugo Milner jumped up to into the top 100, jumped up 72 spots with this win and the points that he got from it. Um, and now he's in the top 100, but he's still only sixth on the British athlete list. However, if you look at the points, he's actually scored more points in this year than 
everyone except Alexey and Barkley Izzard um, on the British team. So he's the highest, third highest point scorer. And he's got a run that is, well, Rapid. competitive. <laughs> so um, maybe he could be putting his hat in the ring for uh, one of those British spots next year. Uh, we'll be watching that, that closely. Yeah. I mean, the race to the Games is almost as exciting as the race at the Games at this yeah, rate, isn't it? it does, yeah, it is exciting. <laughs> uh, now we look at the upcoming races coming up uh, this weekend. And Noosa Triathlon mm. is happening down in Australia. Uh, this is an iconic event. It is actually as old as both Heather and myself. It is 40 <laughs> years old this week, uh, uh, this this time around. Um, and yeah, it'll be uh, another competitive field. Ashley Gentle is going for her 10th win there, which is unbelievable. Uh, yeah. She's only started 11 times. Uh, and yeah, she's going for her 10th win, which is uh, very impressive. Also, Hayden Wilde has announced that he's going to be doing it. Uh, and he's testing out his non-drafting for a very good reason. Mm. Because the following weekend, he uh, wants to do the 70.3 Melbourne, so that he can qualify for 70.3 World Champs. Yeah, that would be cool to see. And that's quite a nice time after the Olympics as well, isn't it, Well, it's not until December. Exactly, so. and it's in his hometown in Taupo, New Zealand. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's very keen to get his uh, slot. And, yeah, plenty of time after the Olympics to change him from a short course racer to a middle distance racer. I mean, last Olympics, we saw Christian wow. Blumfeld do the uh, say all the way to an Ironman in yeah. that amount of time, so... Exactly. Um, there's a, oh, I also spotted that Fenella Language is out there training. She's gone oh. straight from um, Hawaii and sort of the other way around the world and ended up in Australia. And she's been out in Noosa, which is just a stunning area. I, I have been there before. I really did triathlon. But um, she's just put up a post that she's um, looking forward to racing Olympic distance. Triathlon hasn't done anything of that distance, I think, for something like five years. So it's going to be a bit of a shot going from Ooh, Ironman yeah. to that. But That's she's, a she, uh, she's open for the challenge and I think she's seeing it as a bit of fun. So I'm sure we'll see a few names crop up that we haven't spotted yet. I figure if you're out there, you may as well. It's exactly. a, a bit of a bucket list race, yeah, isn't definitely. it, Noosa? And then there's also Ironman Florida happening this weekend, which has suddenly seen an increase in sort of, I guess, level and amount of athletes and pros on the start list, partly because Ironman as well has obviously been cancelled. And interestingly, according to the PTO, their soft score, their strength of field score, they say that this is now more than the European Championships for both the men's and the women's races as a result of all these athletes coming to, to give it a last sort of late season race. Pretty competitive fields. Mm. On the men's side, you've got Magnus Ditlev, Joe Skipper, Rudy von Berg, uh, Matt Hansen, Cam Wirth and Dennis Chevro, to name a few. Uh, so it's going to be very competitive on the men's side. Obviously, the men have had a few more weeks since their world yeah. champs than the women have. But still, a very strong women's field lining yeah. up too. Definitely. The Sky Munch, uh, Jocelyn McCauley, Ruth Arsel, who've obviously all just raced. Lauren Brandon as well. Um, Jen Annette. And then India Lee is doing her, I think, only her second full distance. And she'll be coming off a slightly different training block than the rest of those girls who've come straight from um, the world. So it'll be interesting to see how that race pans out. Yeah. And then there's also Ironman 73, Los Cabos come this coming weekend, if you're interested in tuning in for that one. Okay, now it's time for our pin board where you guys send us your photos of triathlon related stuff. And you can send us anything triathlon related, but for the month of October, we've been asking for your weather related photos. Uh, and we get to a few of those, but obviously for the month of November, which is now starting, we are asking for something different. And this time we're asking for triathletes doing other activities. Could be other sports, cross-training, maybe in the off-season you like to do mountain biking or paddle boarding or whatever it might be. Uh, we'd love to see triathletes doing your other activities. Could just be pastimes, you know, the garden, if you take photos yeah. of yourself cleaning the garden. I don't know whether people do that. Anyway, let's get back to our, our last October weather-related posts. And we have this one from Bobby in New Hampshire. He says, this was last winter and the temps were around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very cold. Uh, I was surprised to find that my beard hair had frozen each strand individually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't think I'd be that surprised. <laughs> Great memories prior to owning a treadmill. Uh, yeah, well, I mean... <laughs> He now owns a treadmill, so obviously there weren't that great memories, were there? Because he went out and bought a treadmill after experiencing that. I mean, it's made a very pretty pattern, hasn't it? That's when you definitely want to grow a full facial beard, I think, in those conditions. Um, next is actually a video from Dave um, on the Hard Knot Pass, and it's him zigzagging up the 25% plus in places um, Hard Knot Pass. Well, that just looks pretty bleak. So that was actually from the Triathlon X Half in Cumbria, and yeah, that doesn't sell the UK and our weather very well, yeah, does it? Yeah, you could hear the rain pelting down there. That's, uh, yeah, didn't look very fun. Uh, next one is from Colton uh, in Hurricane, Wyoming. 
Mm. If your if your place is called Hurricane, I guess you're uh, in for the weather. Uh, my friends and I wanted to go to Zion National Park, but currently I was running for college and needed to keep running through the vacation. I really think there's something so special about going out in the morning before the sunrise while the snow is just pouring down. Not only do you feel like the coolest person ever <laughs> and coldest, but it is just so quiet that you barely hear your feet swishing through the snow. I've been a huge fan of GTN for a while now, but never felt like I had good photos to share. Aww. I've been doing triathlon for the past two years and to be able to watch GTN made me a really big difference. I appreciate your team's attitudes and constant advice. I don't think I would have survived the swims without having it. And he sent us these great photos of him uh, enjoying the early morning snow. Uh, thank you for your post and thank you for your kind words too. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, our next one comes from Nathaniel and it's a picture of his Trek domain. And this is in St. Petersburg, in Florida, um, not, not the cold version <laughs> in Russia. He says, I'm building up my fitness in the second phase of base training. While getting ready to begin my long ride, the sunrise stopped me dead in my tracks. It was so beautiful. Took a moment to appreciate the journey towards my first Ironman 70.3 Chattanooga coming up in May of next year. And that is stunning, isn't it? That looks I'm, like my kind of weather. I reckon I can tolerate that kind of weather. Yeah, I would definitely be stopping to take a photo of that as well. And I like the fact you got your bike in as well as the sunrise. <laughs> nice one. Yeah, well done. We've got one more here. Uh, from James. Uh, it's not weather related, but I thought we'd include it anyway because James just finished my first Ironman 70.3 with a time of 5 hours 37 minutes. My goal was to go under 5 hours, but the bike was way harder than expected with a strong headwind no matter which way we turned. I don't know how those work, but I <laughs> yeah. apparently had one of them. Thanks GTN for all the great videos helping me with my training, transitions, race psychology, etc. You are all a huge help. Well, congratulations James. Well done on getting through that 70.3 and we're so glad that we could help you. Yeah, awesome. Well, if that, that is the end of our weather-related photos, for now at least, we'll still talk about the weather because we are British. But like James <laughs> said, if you do have any pictures of you doing something else at all, activity or sport or something along those lines, then do share it with us using the uploader, which is on screen now, and it can also be found in the description below. Say, Say what? what? Okay, this week I've had a quick look at the comments beneath our Unwritten Rules video because it's got quite heated and some of you were not necessarily always agreeing with us, but there's also been some good suggestions of what should have been included. A lot and, of people um, have been writing down the rules. <laughs> well, yes, that was that was not the point. <laughs> but um, anyway, these guys have got the point. This first one from Sam Pearson says, um, this is a bit of a swimming one, which I totally am with. The pool is where I wish people were more familiar with the Unwritten Rules. Choose a lane appropriate for your pace. Shower before you get in. Don't jump in the lane until others are aware you want to join. Don't block the wall chatting. Uh, tap on the foot means someone wants to pass you. They're not being aggressive. Be aware of others and wait at the wall to let a faster swimmer pass. Unfortunately, the general public don't know swim etiquette, so public sessions can be frustrating. And then there were nine comments beneath this and the conversation <laughs> continued. And I'm not going to include all of those, but it was quite interesting of everyone sort of, some people not really knowing what he was on about, others asking, some learning, some agreeing. So that was I feel like a... some of those rules are actually written down, like shower before you get in. I'm pretty yeah, sure it's written. That one was the one everywhere. that um, people yeah. were talking about, the smell of people's aftershave, which seems to be get exacerbated in the chlorine. There's nothing uh, worse than that when you like, yeah. Hovering anyway. at the surface. Yeah. The pool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Patrick Randolph uh, commented, I'll add one. If you're not in contention for any awards, don't sprint past someone at the finish line or in the finish shoot. Just let them enjoy their moment and then enjoy yours. And that's a pretty good yeah, unwritten like that rule, one. that one, because yeah. a lot of people spend, you know, 13 hours out there doing an Ironman and then feel the need to sprint down the finish line and barging people out their way. <laughs> yeah. It's really not necessary. Exactly, exactly. Um, and this final one we've chosen today is from Rich Hold says, there's been a lot of discussion over how long you should keep your race stickers on your bike and on your helmet. I pitch my sticker, I, I pitch my helmet sticker as soon as I get home. The head tube sticker can stay on until the next race. The seat tube sticker can stay through the first group ride back from that race. I mean, that's interesting. No, no. Uh, no. <laughs> sorry. No. If you I mean, get a little stem sticker, one of you know, those little small ones that'll just identify your bike and it's got the, the race, that, that's okay. Subtle enough, you can keep it on there. Any James other stickers? James says that's okay. I mean, I must admit, when we were editing this video, I then realised, uh, looking back through, that I had left my helmet sticker on for a video that I did with Manon, which I was a little bit mortified about afterwards. I was like, but we can't reshoot the whole thing. Unbelievable. So. We probably yeah, should probably no reshoot the whole thing. That is, uh, <laughs> that is shocking. Well, if you want to see Heather racing Manon, there mm. is another race where they oh, raced yeah. up a hill. Heather versus Manon, uh, bike versus run. And it was a 
pretty tight finish it and was definitely worth close. a watch. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully you guys have enjoyed the show this week. If you want to support us, then we'd love it if you gave the show a like. And if you're not yet subscribing, click on the globe. And if you want something to watch right now, well, that video we've just been talking about, The Unwritten Rules, is on screen for you.